Romans chapter 15, verse 9. The Bible says, And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles trust. Notice that the Bible points out that the gospel will be able to reach to the uttermost parts of the earth and including the Gentiles. And that the Gentiles will be able to rejoice and they'll be able to hear about Jesus Christ. So this is referring to Gentiles as a nation. So this is very important to understand that uh, the nation of Israel, they forsook Jesus Christ, they forsook the gospel, so then the Lord turned to the Gentiles, right? As Gentile nations start to close out the gospel one by one, there's one place that started to be receptive to it. And I believe that's why the Lord's hand was behind this country from its foundations. The Lord was setting up something. Now, you might recall that the Reformation has done its work and has been reaching a lot of souls, and it just destroyed the Catholic Empire. Amen. If you recall, the Catholic Empire was controlling Europe and then England. But then what happened is that England broke from the Catholic Empire, and then the Catholic Empire and the Jesuits tried to control England, but they failed miserably. And then the King James Bible came out. When the King James Bible came out, that was a very huge victory. So when the King James Bible was spread about, now everybody was able to partake in the gospel and everybody was able to get the freedom of the word of God preached to them. However, England was controlled by a particular church that you all might recall, and that's the Anglican Church. The Anglican Church is not much different from the Catholic Church. Basically, it was started by King Henry VIII, where he deemed himself to be the head of the church, not the Pope. So that's the only difference. But pretty much, the church system is the same. The Anglican church system is very pervasive throughout England. So England was becoming more cold. So the Lord couldn't do really uh, do something great with them. Now, the group that was, uh, that was pretty rampant during that time in England, for any hope of revival or the Holy Spirit move, moving, is the Puritans. However, as I've told you before, the Puritans, they were pretty much a dead group because they were influenced by the doctrine of Calvinism. So the Puritans, the Lord could not do really a great work with them. Now, they had a few shining moments. One was their uh, involvement where they pushed the King James Bible. Another one was through Oliver Cromwell, and he did a very big job and did a lot of work against uh, the nation that fixed a lot of errors. And uh, you can get even some good Puritan works and writings, actually. Uh, one work is by Richard Baxter. Lots of good devotional stuff. Actually, one of our members... Uh, who passed away, Big Chuck, he gave me a full volume of it, and he's got a lot of good stuff in there. However, like I told you before, they are influenced with Calvinist doctrine. So because they're uh, influenced by Calvinist doctrine, there's a group that said, okay, we cannot uh, be a part of this church system. The Puritans, they were thinking, we're going to purify the church. That's what they were thinking. Now, you might recall Martin Luther had the same mentality. That's why it was called the Reformation. What he wanted to do was reform the church, not break apart from it, but to reform it. However, because of his independent thinking and believing the word of God as final authority, you can't help but break apart from the church. His intention was to reform it, but uh, the followers couldn't help but just to break apart from it. The Anabaptists, you might recall, they were the ones that were very clear. We're breaking apart from it. Amen. So Luther was more of an in-between type of guy. John Calvin, he's a poor example of a reformer. 
So, as I've taught you before, if we're going to look at these lines again, okay, so I don't know if I can draw these lines really well, um, but remember that like there's like a blue zone that I called it, okay, and then there is like a red zone. So the blue zone will be a Calvinist side, and then a red zone will be our side, where we believe in breaking apart from the Roman heresy. Amen. So Anabaptists were like right here. Calvinists were right here. Now, uh, Martin Luther, he's more of in between. So that's how you get. You get one who's over here, one who's in between, one who's in the red. Okay. Now, when we go to England, you notice that, right? The Anglican Church, that's the system that's pretty heretical. Puritans are in that blue zone. Okay, kind of like the Calvinists. Okay, we're going to purify it. But obviously, you can't purify what's corrupt. So, guess who the red zone is, all right? So the red zone says, we're going to separate ourselves from that church. Hence, they became known as separatists. Now, for some of you, I don't know if you learned this in your history class, but if you know who they are, they're important. They were eventually the pilgrims who sailed to America. That's why this is very important, okay? Separatist says we're going to have no part of that one. Eventually, what you're going to find out is Anabaptists, remember, they want to break away from the church, right? So once they got their Baptist distinctives, their beliefs more down, you'll notice Separatists are almost interchangeable with Baptists. Hence... The first Baptist came to the scene. That's how it was born. It was born from this breaking apart. So uh, I'm going to be reading uh, John Widdowson's, uh, no, not John Widdowson, Frederick Widdowson's book, A Bible Believer's Guide to World History. And I'll be reading from uh, page three, excuse me, right here, 297, okay? It reads as follows. With regard to the history of the Baptist churches in England, the line of English churches, the line of English churches that can be traced historically, who consistently called themselves Baptists, began in 1610 in Holland. That's very close to 1611. KJV. According to some sources, this is not to say there were no Baptists in Britain earlier, but that this, uh, but that this began a line of churches whose history can be traced. It began with a man named John Smith, who was a bishop in the Church of England. In 1606, after study of the New Testament, he was convinced that the doctrines and practices of the Church of England were not biblical, and thus he resigned his position as priest and left the church. Baptists, like myself, are fond of saying that we are not Protestants, but from a much earlier line of Christians extending back to the apostles, but the plain truth is that the churches that first called themselves Baptists can only be traced this way. There is a heresy called Baptist Bride, which insists that only the Baptist church is a New Testament church, which is, of course, nonsense. So uh, to make a balancing point for some of you people, so we are Baptists and we pride ourselves in that. And then if you go to the Baptist distinctives, the Bible-believing distinctives, it can go all the way back. However, there is a heretical group group called Baptist Brider. A lot of independent fundamental Baptist churches are briders, they would call it. Now, some of you might say, what is a brider? A brider insists that, uh, okay, so this is so weird. So they insist that only the Baptist church is the bride of Christ. So if you're a saved Christian and you're in, from a Methodist church or a Presbyterian church, Episcopalian church or whatever, that you're not part of the bride of Christ. Also, if you got baptized from a different church, so we believe once you're saved, you get water baptized, right? All right, it doesn't matter where, as long as you get immersed underwater, all right? But the Baptist church claims, no, if you want to be a part of our church membership, you have to get water baptized by our church. So that's a Baptist bride heresy. And you know what's even funnier than that? They believe that, yeah, we, our traces go all the way back to John the Baptist. Why? Because he's called John the Baptist. So that's proof that our Baptist churches go all the way back. No, silly. It's because the name is Baptist. So then the proof of John 
The name John goes all the way back to John then? Could I argue that way? <laughs> all you Johns out there are related to John the Baptist because of the word John right there. You have to do the fair share with that. If you want to take out the Baptist from him, then why, why not John, you know? So that's just a weird thing. So that's Baptist bride heresy. So you got to watch out for that. Yeah. All right, uh, aside from that heresy, we do take pride and we do take appreciation for our heritage, though, as Baptists. Otherwise, we wouldn't have existed. You have to understand why we're called Baptist Church. Yeah. There's a reason for that. The reason we call ourselves Baptist Church is because out of all denominations, the Baptists were the ones who are always the closest to the Bible. And that's evident throughout church history. Do Baptists have their fault? Sure, they always have their fault. As a matter of fact, there's so many different splits among Baptist denominations. So that's why we're called independent Baptists. But that's a whole different story in history. Okay. But the Baptists have been the ones that were the closest to the Bible, even though they have imperfections themselves. So it's important to keep that in mind, okay? So we stick to denominations that's the closest to the Bible. Amen. That's why we dub ourselves Baptist, okay? But anyway, let's see right here. They say, um, he writes, Baptists uh, were simply unique among Protestant churches in their opposition to, to the alliance between church and state until recently and infant baptism. That's a huge importance you want to know. That's the reason why, think about it, how did America become formed with separation of church and state? That's the huge thing, right? They wanted religious liberty, free from persecution. What was the key to all that? Because the Roman Catholic Church was mingling with state. And today we're seeing how state is mingling with religious affairs. It's becoming more communist, right? So that's how America was born with that separation. That's why it became a very successful country. Until now, it's just falling apart now. They're mingling that church and state idea. Where did they get that concept from, America? They got it from the pilgrims who are separatists who have Baptist heritage. Amen. See, you have to realize that. Now, I'm going to show you a lot of eye-opening things that uh, you never heard from liberal schools. Come on. Okay? You never heard this from liberal schools. You wonder why they always talk trash about uh, their country and about uh, Christianity? I'll tell you why. It's because all the way back, that's how they were successful, and they want to hide that. That's right. So they want to drown it with liberal garb and revisionist history and modernism garbage. That's a disguise for socialism and communism, but they're too cowardly and dishonest not to say that to you. So that's the brainwashing tactic of the school. So I'm going to teach you real history, okay? That they don't, that they don't tell you. Because of persecution by the Anglican Church of all who disagreed with it and who refused to submit to its authority, John Smith had to flee England. In Amsterdam, he, along with Thomas Hilwys and 36 others formed the first Baptist Church of Englishmen, known to have stood for baptism of believers only, rejecting infant baptism completely. Notice they were similar with Anabaptists. Anabaptists were that way, if you recall. So recall this. So remember this. They were in England. Then they moved to uh, the Netherlands, okay? So they were in Dutch territory. So follow along. That way you can see where the pilgrims come from. Because they didn't come from England, actually. They come from Netherlands. But they were originally Englishmen. Smith believed that the only real apostolic succession is a succession of biblical New Testament truth and not of outward ordinances and visible organizations such as the Church of England or the Roman Church. Yeah, amen. Amen. He believed the only way to, let's see right here, the next page. Ah, come on. He believed the only way to recover was to form a new church based on the Bible. So <laughs> this is what he did, all right, being a Baptist. You know how Baptists are, right? They can go to the extremes, okay? So he baptized himself, which is obviously not biblical, obviously, all right? But that's one, one thing you notice about these Baptists, like that. They go to the extreme, like they'll go all the way, you know. Amen. 
and then the others of his congregation. In only a few years, however, the church had dwindled to 10 members, losing many to the Mennonites and other groups in Holland. Yeah, no surprise. Okay. Smith died in 1612, and the church ended in Holland shortly thereafter with Huey, Thomas, and John Merton returning to England as persecution there had lessened. History records that the members of this Baptist church went back to England or remained in Holland and joined Mennonites. It did not produce a succession of other churches, but those who founded it went on to establish other Baptist churches in England. Back in England, these men, upon returning to England, formed the first recorded Baptist church on English soil. By 1626, the churches had grown from one to five churches, and by 1644, there were 40 congregations. The Baptist movement grew rapidly. These first Baptist churches formed in England were Armenian in theology, which taught that all men could be saved. So notice right here that the first Baptist churches, they were anti-Calvinist. You remember Jacob Arminius that I talked about? He was the one who was trained by uh, Calvin's people, but he went against Calvin's theology. Uh, obviously, Arminianism has its fault, as I've taught you before. But the point is, is that our history is an anti-Calvinist pattern Amen. or an anti-Catholic pattern. Amen. That's very important with our history. Uh, let's see over here. The Calvinistic or particular Baptist were a different group and believed in limited atonement in which only the elect could be saved. So notice that there was a particular, uh, they, they were called particular Baptists. So they were Calvinists in their background. So Calvinists, what you're going to hear them argue, Calvinists will argue that, well, didn't you know your Baptist heritage goes back to Calvinism? And people go, oh, well, no, silly. There were different Baptists. Why? Look at today. There's so many different branches of Baptist, okay? So don't just think all of us came from one Baptist. It's a really silly thing. Particular Baptists had their beginnings around 1616 when some dissenters left the Church of England and were led by the Reverend Henry Jacob. By 1644, these congregations grew to seven churches. Okay, so, so far, you get it. The Baptist uh, groups, they were in Netherlands and they were in England. Okay, now... Let's read some interesting uh, things here as we hit the same timeline. And remember, the Catholics, they're taking over the New World, America. And the English, uh, the English Reformed groups, they're also getting involved in that. But then where can we get the Bible believers, the Baptists, right? Okay, so we're going to, I'm going to read from William Grady's book. And this is the book titled, How Satan Turned America Against God. I'll be reading page 99. With Christian Europe embroiled in this imbroglio of genocide, few notice the departure of a creaky little vessel crowded with religious fanatics. By year two of the Thirty Years' War, the Pilgrim Fathers had safely arrived at Plymouth Rock, over 3,000 miles away. The privation of the first winner at Plymouth Rock is legendary. The price tag for God's vindication would be high. Of the many tales of suffering, uh, the most poignant has rarely been told in grade school. We were informed that a dozen of the original pilgrim wives did not live to see May flowers. What we haven't heard is why. Having spent 70 days at sea, those godly women decided that their first priority in America was to wash the clothes of their beloved husbands and children. The fact that it was November and three quarters of a mile lay between their anchored ship and the shoreline along Cape Cod did not appear to matter. For their family's sake, they would gladly wade through the icy waist-high water. They had not yet heard that a woman's place is in the mall, so to speak. As William Brewster had previously assured the Virginia Company, that is, petitioning parishioners were not as other men, so-called so not as other men, their spirited wives would likewise prove to be not as other women. Sadly, they had not anticipated that the chilly winter temperature would prevent them from adequately drying their own drenched garments, 
resigned to their fate, referring to their death shrouds as coats of iron, most contracted monomia and expired before springtime. Thus, in the providence of God, a few devoted housewives became the sacred foundation deposits for the mightiest nation in history. Silah. Would you believe that? So when the pilgrims came in and landed in Plymouth Rock, how America was uh, able to continue to grow was because of the women. Amen. The women taking care of it, being very faithful supporters. You women should not uh, overlook what God called you to be. As supporters, it can create something great. Now, he said this. Now, although the pilgrims were technically Protestants, their early exit from the Church of England and extended, extended sojourn in Holland, coupled with the exposure of their first pastor, John Robinson, to a community of 4,000 Dutch, Dutch and a Baptist under exile in Norwich, brought them closer to the New Testament standard than most. They were certainly light years removed from their Puritan cousins who established the larger Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1629. While the pilgrims were labeled separates, because of separatists, right, for having broken ties with their religious taskmasters, the deluded Puritans believed that they could purify the system from within. Not only did they fail to stem the Anglican apostasy, but the important consequences of their well-intentioned yet hopelessly unscriptural approach threatened to corrupt New England as well. By the time the Puritans attempted to give it up, they had unknowingly assimilated many of the intolerant philosophies held by their despised antagonists. Now, this is what he says on page 101. The Baptists arrive in America. Fortunately, the Lord had no intention of allowing such nonsense to interfere with his plans for America. He was not the least bit impressed with that touted city on a hill in Massachusetts, as it represented the major ideological impediment to the eventual reinstatement of Jerusalem on Mount Zion. So remember, because of that Puritan influence, right? Because the Puritans are also trying to cave in. Now, I'm going to remember what I told you, Catholic influence as well as the Calvinist influence over here. But then the pilgrims were the ones that came in who were the most extreme and the most uh, separate, so to speak. So then William Grady is arguing right here that the Lord's not going to allow the, those, uh, those church state people do their thing. He's, he writes, a small but determined number of Baptist pioneers began to appear in New England. Although John Christian writes the exact date of the arrival of the First Baptists in America and their names are uncertain, the fact of their early appearance and influence was noted even by several Puritan authorities. Governor Winslow wrote of the Baptists in 1646, We have some living among us, nay, some of our churches of that judgment. Cotton Mather adds that, quote, Many of the first settlers of Massachusetts were Baptists. And they were as holy and watchful and faithful and heavenly people as any, perhaps, in the world, end of quote. In a discourse delivered at the dedication of the Baptist Church and Society in Warren, Rhode Island, Baptist historian J.P. Tustin declared, quote, Multitudes of Baptist ministers and members came from Europe and settled in different parts of this continent, each becoming the center of an independent circle wherever they planted themselves. Let's see right here. The first Baptist church in the state of uh, Massachusetts was formed in 1663 at the town of Swansea, Plymouth Colony, by Reverend John Miles of Wales. Other intelligent approximations for the first Baptist churches in the remaining 12 colonies are given by David Benedict as follows. Providence, Rhode Island, 1639. New York, New York, prior to 1669. Somerton, South Carolina, 1683. Cold Spring, Pennsylvania, 1684. Middletown, New Jersey, 1688, etc., etc. And he gives all the proof. So the bottom line is this. The bottom line is the Baptists were there at the foundation of America. Known Baptists, this is interesting, okay? So he says right here... Um, 
However, the same Protestant theologian who revered our Baptist ancestors as heavenly people referred to their doctrines as the briars of Anabaptism. Oh, amen. Yeah, the Anabaptists. Amen. Yeah, amen to that one. In Mather's Holy Commonwealth, the battle lines were soon drawn over infant sprinkling. The Baptists would have none of it, referring to the unscriptural practice as, quote, the badge of the whore. Amen. Not only did Baptist parents, not only did Baptist parents refuse to have their own infants sprinkled, but they rebelled at being forced to witness the heretical ceremony, period. Amen. While some would turn their back at the ordinance, Others would literally storm out of the meeting house, only to be tackled by incensed magistrates and dragged back inside. Christopher Goodwin of Charleston was sentenced to pay a fine of 10 pounds or be given 10 stripes for having thrown the baptismal basin on the floor. <laughs> Another exasperated brother by the name of William Witter was hauled into court for having declared, quote, they who stayed while a child was baptized do worship the devil, end of quote. <laughs> Known Baptists could rarely vote or hold public office and were frequently subject to fines, whippings, and or imprisonment. Yeah, no surprise right there. On November 13, 1644, the General Court of Massachusetts passed a law for the suppression of Baptists accusing them of being, quote, incendiaries of the commonwealths and the infectors of persons in main matters of religion and the troublers of all churches in all places where they have been, end of quote. Any of the sect who would, quote, this is what they declared, so Baptists were persecuted. Imagine that in the foundation of America. By who? By who? Wow, these infant baby sprinklers, part of the Anglican church, Puritan, Puritan people. And you heard about those Salem witch trials that the liberals try to uh, cram down your throat. Oh, they burn witches. They burn witches, the Christians. Ah, they were Puritan people. Oh. Baptists have nothing to do with that. Come on. Yeah, you see why we kick Calvinism pretty hard over here? Okay, but anyways, going back here. Uh... Any of the sect who would, quote, oppose the baptizing of infants or go about secretly to seduce others from the approbation or use thereof or shall purposely depart the congregation at the ministration of the ordinance shall be sentenced to banishment, end of quote. I'm going to give you some of these names who were banished, actually. Given the uh, Grady rights, given the unprecedented Baptist contributions to this nation, Perhaps the most inane declaration of all was the prophecy uttered by a delegation of Puritan divines to the leg legislature in 1668, denouncing the Baptists as, quote, un-American subversives, end of quote. They went on record as warning, quote, if once that party becomes numerous and prevailing, this country is undone. The work of reformation ended. That's the Baptist. That's our Baptist heritage, actually, for some of you who didn't know. Okay, now let's rewind a bit. I've given you a little bit of collection, okay? So, review. Pilgrims land over here. Baptists soon were to follow, and that's no surprise. Why? Because the separatists or the pilgrims were in the same region as those Baptists were. Okay, you remember, the Baptists, they started their church. We're going to break apart from the Anglican church. Now let's rewind a bit, okay? So you can follow along how the Baptist and then the Pilgrims collided, okay? So there is a relationship here. All right, let's go back, okay? We already, I already explained about the Baptists. They fled from England to the Netherlands, right? Then they went back into England because there was persecution. So remember this, those, uh, remember that the Anglican Church and even Calvinists were persecuting people. Mm -hmm. I've explained that one, okay? So they weren't really godly men, okay? So I don't like Calvinism, period. That was a thorn on the side throughout Bible-believing history, okay? Now, anyways, let's rewind and let's review a bit. Okay, separatists complained against the Anglican Church, not just Baptists. So we separate from the Anglican Church. Once they did that, they were suffering persecution. Now, my source is from 
uh, audio recording. It's called American History from a Biblical Perspective, and that's by Richard Sow. I would highly recommend that. So they went to the Netherlands, and they were hoping in the Netherlands they could get religious freedom. However, the separatists, when they were in the Netherlands, uh, they were still suffering persecution because they were English, so not related to Dutch. A second thing, their children were learning worldly practices yeah. in the Netherlands. So this was pretty dangerous. Now, if you recall your previous discipleship lesson, why they fled to the Netherlands is because of William of Orange, okay? The work that he did. Remember that during the 30 years war nonsense that was going around, the good guys who were soldiers were pretty much uh, Oliver Cromwell and William of Orange, okay? So that's why they fled to the Netherlands. But then what happened is that the kids were learning the worldly practices of the Netherlands. So then the separatists, they were saying, well, we can't raise our children over here. Now, they said, okay, we heard about the new world, so let's go to the new world. So, they're like, so then they went on a ship. They were known as the pilgrims. And these pilgrims went on that ship and sailed over here. Now, let's rewind a little bit more, okay? As they were sailing over here, like I told you last discipleship, this is a miracle. Remember in previous discipleship classes, who was already uh, making way into the new world, into America? The Catholic, because of their explorations. Yeah. They were killing, they were doing massive slaughters of the uh, Aztecs, the, uh, the Mayan civilization in South America, as well as North America, the natives, all right? And they were doing slave trade, okay? So remember, this was, uh, and the liberal schools taught you that it was Christianity, it was Christianity. This was Catholic baloney, okay? Amen. It was all Catholic, okay? But the French Catholics, as they were in North America and Canada, Canada, for some weird reason, they never hit down here. And then the Spaniards with their Catholicism, they never went up here. Now, those uh, English people, they were also involved in the colonization. The Anglican church apostasy and that Puritan work apostasy, they were sailing over here. And as, as I've read to you, in, uh, from Grady's book, when those Puritans were taking territory, the Lord was raising up a, a bunch of people, the Baptists, and the pilgrims laid out the foundation. But let me tell you how crazy it is for the pilgrims to land here, okay? Because the Catholics couldn't reach there from north and south, and then the English with their Anglican church and Puritans, they couldn't reach right over there either, okay? Let's rewind a bit, okay? Quetzalcoatl, uh, I think that's how you pronounce it. So I'm reading from William Grady's book on page 179. Let's rewind a bit. Don't forget Satan has his dark globalists and elites behind the scene. All right? Now, before we hit to Freemasonry with America with the Founding Fathers, let's rewind a bit, okay? It was long before that. So as the Baptist, you got to realize this, Satan was, he could have, he was trying to invade this country. But then God had a remnant that started within the foundations of America. A lot of people find dark elites, globalist stuff, or Freemasonry, Catholic stuff, and all kinds of God knows what with the birth of America. But uh, that was all of Satan's attacks, you got to realize. In the midst of all that darkness, God had a shining light that really started the foundation of the nation. And this nation was truly founded on biblical principles, not masonry, Catholic, or, um, or dark elitist stuff. It was on Baptist distinctives, okay? So, let me, uh, so let's go th throughout this story. That's why there's a greater appreciation of this country, you got to realize, because of all the darkness and the demonic attacks that he infiltrated. So let's go back to Quetzalcoatl, okay? Uh, Grady writes right over here. Uh, does the location and history, uh, on page 178, does the location and history of the infamous Bermuda Triangle have a part in this uh, conjecture? Despite our human inability to have full understanding of such matters, do certain historical facts exist to stimulate harmless speculation? According to the religious history of Central and South America, uh, Quetzalcoatl was the most important god worshipped throughout the mighty Aztec Empire. Now, 
If you remember our previous discipleship class, I talked about that God. And it was like a serpent God. That was worship. Should we be surprised that his name means flying serpent? The Encyclopedia Americana states that his principal form was a plume serpent, a rattlesnake covered with beautiful green Quetzal feathers. How interesting. When in human form his skin was light in color, it was said that he had a strong body, broad forehead, large eyes, and a flowing beard. He wore a miter on his head and usually dressed in a long white robe. His feet were covered with a design of red crosses. He was supposedly born of a virgin. That is antichrist, man. That is antichrist. His actions were full of wisdom and benevolence, except for a slight drinking problem. <laughs> Actually, the story goes that uh, Ket couldn't hold his liquor and eventually got expelled to the underworld for a number of sexual indiscretions. However, before leaving, he entrusted his teachings and the purpose of his mission to a secret order of priests who were to occupy until he was sober enough to rule once again. Let's see right here. As if all of this were not bizarre enough, an 1895 edition of a magazine called Lucifer, published by the Occult Theosophical Society, gave a very strange insight, insight into the word origin of the word America. You know what those dark elites said about America? Hist Although most historians attribute the name America to the explorer Amerigo Vespucci, author James Price has a different theory altogether. All right. According to Price, the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl was known in Peru as Amaru, and his domain, domain was called, you guessed it, Amaruca. That's where America comes from. Price writes, as cited by William Still, from the latter comes our word America. Amaruca is literally translated land of the plumed serpent. The priests of this God of peace once ruled the Americas. All the red men who have remained true to the ancient religion are still under their sway. Another prominent heathen, Manly Hall, claims that the, since the serpent is often a symbol of Lucifer, it is no exaggeration to extrapolate from this that America may well mean, quote, land of Lucifer. Manly P. Hall said that. He claimed that America is, known, is named as land of Lucifer. Whether or not any of this is true, we can be certain that Lucifer was not a happy camper when the pilgrims came ashore at Plymouth Rock. That's why you can see all this attacks happening. That's why you can see the devil wouldn't be happy when they land over here. Okay, now, this is long ago in Americas, right? Yeah. Land of Lucifer. He had his own uh, evil system. Now, let's... The year passed by, so I'm giving you a history behind America. That way you can understand how important it was for the pilgrims to land there, all right? Okay, let's go to one of the secret societies. Now, Grady has, a, I would highly recommend his book. If you want to get into the globalist elite stuff, he has a great chapter called Serpents in Paradise. He goes all the way back to the Jewish sex, actually. This was during the time of Christ, actually and then building up throughout history. So it's very interesting. I already read to you about the Jewish sects in my uh, discipleship classes, so I'm not going to really get into that. You recall the Gnostics, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if you go to the Rosicrucian Egyptian Museum, it's wild. They'll claim the Gnostics as one of the early leaders for all that uh, globalist, dark, you know, conspiracy knowledge stuff. It's weird, all right? I've talked to you about the Knights Templar, now, let's talk about the Rosicrucians. Guess what they were? They were close to the timeline of the King James Bible. Okay. Page 219 of Grady's book. In the year 1614, an anonymous pamphlet was printed in Kassel, Germany, entitled Fama Fraternitatis, relating how a former monastic student, Christian Rosenkreutz, had discovered the secrets of the universe while traveling in Arab lands toward the close of the 14th century. 
Supposedly, Chris went on to establish the hush-hush fraternity of the Rose Cross to guard these sacred mysteries. Before expiring in 1484, at the age of 106, though the founder's story is probably legend, most esoteric authorities contend that the Rosicrucians themselves represent an historic reincarnation of the Knights Templar. So you thought those Knights Templar have, uh, have become extinct, but some people claim that they are the reincarnation of that. Well, the simple answer is this. The same spirit that was in the Knights Templar, even if they were eradicated, continued on with the Rosicrucians. That's the simple answer. It's Satan. They got the same father. Anyway, because the love of the money is the root of all evil, the most coveted mystery in any society was alchemy, the art of transmuting base metals into gold. The practice was also supposed to be capable of producing the so-called philosopher's stone, through which one can gain immortality. Go to that Rosicrucian Egyptian museum. All right, look, that's one of the top tourist sites in Silicon Valley, all right? Believe it or not. It's not Yahoo, it's not Facebook, it's Rosicrucian Egyptian Museum, okay? That's one of the top tourist sites here. If you go over there, they have a room, and that's an alchemy room. Anyways. Rosicrucians were addicted to the spiritual interpretation of natural science. According to one tradition, the word rose was not taken from the flower depicted on the Rosicrucian cross, but rather from the Latin res, signifying dew, which was supposedly the most powerful solvent of gold, while Krups, the cross, was a chemical hieroglyphic for light. They were also into child sacrificing, cherishing toads, dancing with fiends, making poisonous powders and packs with the devil. Whoa, you never heard that. <laughs> Over here, what have all these secret societies to do with the founding and latter history of the United States? William Still writes this. This is important. Quote, By the dawn of the 1700s, all along the eastern seaboard, most of the important secret societies of Europe already had sturdy footholds in colonial America. That's why. Manly P. Hall, he's a famous uh, occultist. He added this, quote, The Brotherhoods oh. mm -hmm. met in their rooms over inns and similar public buildings, practicing their ancient rituals exactly according to the fashion in Europe and England. End of quote. Grady writes, Thus the serpents were now loose in paradise. So notice that, okay, one, remember, America originated as land of Lucifer, all right, the land of the flying serpent. If that same spirit is right in there, he's going to attract those other people who have that same spirit. <coughs> Thus, that's why those secret societies, Rosicrucians is just one example, or any other secret society that you would join, if they share that same spirit, they're going to be drawn and come over here. So they were getting into here. So remember this, it's not just, look at the odds right here. America was founded... As I've told you, that Aztec paganism, one, <coughs> the Native Americans' paganism, right? Yeah. So paganism, one, with that Sons of God activity that I've taught you in previous discipleship class. Two, Catholicism spreading rampant. And if there's any sign of Christianity, it's a Calvinist thing. And fourth, you got the secret societies of globalists in there. Already long before the founding fathers. They were at an odds, okay? Now, this is wild. Page 219, the new Atlantis. The worst thing I could say is, let's continue next Wednesday, right? So let me read this, okay? All right. I know you guys hate that part, so let me read as much as I can. Page 219, the new Atlantis. Perhaps the man most responsible, yet least recognized, for America's early colonization as well as the inception of her secret societies, was none other than the renowned British state, statesman, Sir Francis Bacon. Okay, so we come to Rosicrucians, Quetzalcoatl, and then Sir Francis Bacon. Now this is wild, okay? William Still writes this. In the early 1600s, Bacon authored a novel entitled New Atlantis, 
which laid out the idea for a utopian society across the ocean from Europe where mankind could build a new civilization based upon the principles he believed to be those of the legendary lost continent of Atlantis. And this is Bacon's book. You know what Bacon's, uh, let's see. This is from William Still's book titled New World Order, The Ancient Plan of Secret Societies. Now, one might ask how a stuffy British philosopher, Sir Francis Bacon, would be acquainted with the occultic paradise of Atlantis. Here's a connection. Here it. Nesta Webster relates, quote, as we have already seen, Bacon is recognized to have been a Rosicrucian. That's why. All right. Baconian scholar and secret society enthusiast Marie Bauer Hall describes Sir Francis as, quote, she describes Sir Francis Bacon as the guiding light of the Rosicrucian order, the members of which the torch of true universal knowledge, the secret doctrine of the ages alive during the dark night of the Middle Ages. Oh, my goodness. All right. Anyway, there's a lot of quotes. I don't have time to read this. Let's get down to the, the, the interesting part. Sir Walter Raleigh, for some of you who have heard of that name, he was one of those earlier guys before the pilgrims that landed over here, okay? Began the British colonization of America in 1585 with his gold hunting expedition to Roanoke Island off the coast of what is now North Carolina. The 24-year-old nobleman was already a member of a secret society that was known as what? The Baconian Circle. So they were infiltrating America. Look, look what the Lord did. This is very crazy, okay? Almost as if to tell the devil that the Tar Heel State was set apart for Shubal Stearns and the Sandy Creek Baptist Church. All right, so I'm going to... So what's going on is this, is that Shubal Stearns, I'm going to tell you about him later on, that's how the Baptists spread out in that same region that the secret societies were at. But the Lord did something to this group. That way the Baptists, the Lord can pave a way for those Baptists, Shubal Stearns and those guys that I'll tell you about later. God allowed the local savages to completely annihilate the Roanoke settlement. In fact, all that was ever found by later rescue parties were four unintelligible letters. Croa. So that was probably mentioned in some of your history books that you probably remember. But they didn't tell you about the background of this guy and that the Lord was trying to do something there. <laughs> you know what Grady says? Croa maybe it stood for catastrophe resembling old Atlantis. <laughs> 22 years later, a second attempt at colonization was made at Jamestown, Virginia. Okay, so right over here. So North Carolina, then Jamestown, Virginia. Okay, let's see what happens over here. Okay. Francis Bacon was one of the early members of the chartered Virginia company. Uh-oh. Okay. However, because these materialistic fools came for the same golden chamber pots, that the Roanoke adventurers had searched for, their escapade was doomed from the start. The starving pioneers of Bacon's second New Atlantis were constrained to partake of cadaver stew in the rapidly expanding graveyard, and to add insult to injury, the flagship of a rescue fleet wrecked near, guess where, the Bermuda Triangle. As their pilgrim cousins arrived at Plymouth, in 1620, with a scriptural agenda, we would expect to see an appreciable difference in the blessings department. So you see how the Lord protected from that birth? He was doing something. He was setting something. You know what he was trying to do? He's setting a Baptist distinctives. That's what he was trying to do. So then the pilgrims, let's now... Go to the story of the pilgrims. That's crazy, man. I mean, that's crazy. So the Lord was going, they were, they are known, the pilgrims, as the first ones, right? Yeah. They were known as the first ones, not the other guys. If you listen to Rick Sowell's American history from a biblical perspective, when they colonized, when they landed there, they just died on the spot and they were suffering disease and 
they were influenced by Anglican Puritan uh, mindsets of uh, arist uh, that rich ruling class mindset and that they were so lazy and they were dying out. But then the ones who are closest to the Baptist distinctives or the Bible, they were the ones that succeeded. When they landed over here, and you'll know this from your history. So the story that I'm giving to you is from Rick Sal's work. They suffered through a terrifying winter, obviously, and many of them died. And they were a small group. But when they came in and then uh, the spring started to come out and the snow melted, you wouldn't believe it. But what happened was is that they were near a Native American tribe. And, you know, Native Americans were known for wiping out the, the English colonizers or the Catholic colonizers. But for some weird reason, this particular Native group made peace with them. Now, what are the chances of that happening? The Maybe the Lord liked this group yeah. compared to the other groups. And then one of the people was Samoset. Yeah. Samoset approached him. And then what are the odds? They had another Native American named Squanto. Squ what are the odds? Squanto, he came at a time. Okay, let's rewind a bit. All right. You can see God's hand all connecting here. All right. Squanto, what happened was is that uh, so he lived in America, obviously, but then he, want, he had an interest in the white culture. So he traveled along with them, learned English from them. When he returned to his native homeland, they were all gone. He had no place to live. He found solace with where Samoset's uh, Indian tribe was at. And at that time, that's when the pilgrims came and Squanto was able to talk to them in English and communicate. What are the odds? Amen. What are the odds, man? The Lord was like, you can, there's no doubt God's hand is behind this when he started in America. Uh, Governor William Bradford was the one in charge. And uh, I think I wrote his name. Uh, yeah, right here. Okay, so the pilgrims came through, riding down, and they had to have a compact so that they can start a colony over there. So they called it Mayflower Conflat, Compact. The, the governor in charge was William Bradford. They held their first Thanksgiving feast. That's why we have the holiday, all right? So uh, Thanksgiving. And then when they had their uh, Thanksgiving feast, what happened was they were learning everything from the Native Americans, right? From the natives. So then when they were, uh, then they were suffering uh, plantation issues, building issues, and the second year was coming along. And then the pilgrims and William Bradford's like, what's going on over here? Why are we suffering? And you know what they said? It's because we haven't been going to church. We haven't been reading the Bible. We haven't been praying. So we're going to start doing that. You know what happened after that? Their plantation grew so big that when they held their next Thanksgiving feast, the natives, where Squanto's tribe was at, when they all came to partake in the Thanksgiving feast, they had more food than the natives. And those pagan in, uh, natives, they were like saying, wow, this is something right here. This is unheard of. And they spoke positively of their religion and their God after that. So that's God, how God used the pilgrims. And then, because of what they started and they founded, like I read from William Grady's book, the Baptists came flooding in right over here because they had the same uh, mindset of separation of church and state. They had the same mindset of being very biblical, a Baptist distinctive. And we shall continue that next discipleship, okay? So we're going to tell you the first Baptist church. The first Baptist church they'll tell you is Roger Williams. But believe it or not, there's another guy before him in America. And I'm going to tell you these Baptist uh, heroes that were persecuted by Calvinist, English, colonized, Anglican-minded, influenced people. But our Baptist forefathers hung out through persecution, just like the Anabaptists who suffered from those Calvinists, remember? Those reformers. So we have a history, a very proud history. And then Schubel Stearns, where the globalists could not succeed, he was the reason why we have the Bible Belt in the South. It was Schubel Stearns. All next time, all right? You're going to enjoy it. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the people. I pray that we'll truly appreciate our history, where we come from, 
And that, uh, Lord, this is a battle. Every historical timeline, the devil is always at work and there's a battle. But your Christian church as a remnant remained strong and somehow stood out. Do so again with our church and with the other Bible believers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>